Welcome to the aquarium. It's good to see all of you here this evening. You're in for a, a special treat, but before I introduce our speaker, I want to acknowledge the support of our sponsor for the series that we've done on climate change. It's the Donald Slavic Family Foundation, and Gazette Newspapers is a sponsor for the entire series, but we're indebted to the Slavic Foundation. Our speaker this evening is Professor Richard Somerville, and he's going to discuss climate change and climate policy. He's a theoretical meteorologist. He's a distinguished professor emeritus from the Scripps Institution of Oceanography. He's been there since 1979. Just can't find a job, I guess, Richard. Uh, he received his PhD from New York University. He grew up in the Washington, D.C. area, went to Penn State, got his bachelor's degree there in meteorology. He's been a, a meteorologist since he was 10 years old. He had a weather station in the backyard. He made daily weather observations, and he has been hooked on this field. He is one of the leading climate scientists in the world. There's no question about that. And he not only, though, writes for his peers, but he also has written for the general public. And there's a wonderful book called The Forgiving Air. It's now in its second edition. I highly recommend it. It's good reading. It, it tells a lot of very important stories. His honors include the election as a fellow to both the American Association for the Advancement of Science and the American Meteorological Society. He was a contributing lead author to the most recent climate science, science assessment by the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the IPCC. You probably know that the 2007 Nobel Prize, Peace Prize was shared equally between Al Gore and the IPCC members. And he also was one of uh, the co-authors of a very important document, the Copenhagen Diagnosis, which brought the IPCC findings up to date as of December of last year. And it's, a, it's very worthwhile reading. He's an amazing guy, not just because he's an outstanding scientist. He's involved in outreach, in education of all kinds, and um, he's a wonderful colleague. He's been involved here with us recently in a forum called After the Gulf, What Did We Learn? He gave one of the kickoff lectures describing the kind of a world that we could live in by the end of this century if we did not reduce our dependence on fossil fuels. He's always willing to give advice. Over dinner, he met with a group of students from Santa Monica High School who are going to be participating in the second uh, in the next in, uh, National Ocean Science Bowl. They will be representing this region, and, and they will be working with the aquarium for that. It's a real pleasure to introduce Professor Richard Somerville. Please join me in welcoming him. Okay, good. Thank you all for coming. Thank you, Jerry, for this very kind introduction. Uh, here are the plans and ground rules for this evening. I'm going to talk, as has been said, about both climate science and about policy. And I'll try to distinguish between them very carefully. When I'm talking about the climate science, the what do we know part, then I'm going to give you my level best summary of the best current scientific understanding of climate change that we have, and I think that a great majority of mainstream climate scientists would subscribe to it. When I talk about policy later on, then I'm just talking as one of nearly seven billion citizens of the planet, and my preferences and feelings about policy are, are also in, include a science background, but also my own personal values and priorities and so on. So I'll try to distinguish between them. My, my theory has always been that wise policy ought to be made uh, best when it's informed by sound science in an area like this, which has so much technical underpinnings. Uh, William Buckley, the conservative uh, commentator and author, who was not a liberal Democrat, once said that he'd rather be governed by the first 500 names in the Boston phone book instead of the Harvard faculty. And I... I can understand that viewpoint, but I think if you're dealing with a technical subject and the Harvard faculty has relevant expertise, you could ask them about it before you turned over the decision to the first 500 names. Uh, 
And so that's the, where I'm coming from on that. I haven't uh, planned a great long slideshow. I've got 20 slides to show you. I'll be done before 8 o'clock. I'm uh, open to questions for as long as the aquarium will let us stay. And uh, I've also got some URLs for websites for those of you who want to dig more deeply into uh, any of the aspects of what I'm talking about. So that's the, the plan. I'm going to linger lovingly over some of these slides, but I promise to get through all of them by, by 8 o'clock. Now here's one of the ones to linger over. This is the most famous graph in earth science. It's known as the Keeling curve. And what it is, is a depiction of the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, which is on this vertical axis here, versus time from 1958 until nearly the present. The last data point here is from last March. But right now, in these units, which are parts per million by volume, which means molecules per million molecules, the average is about uh, 390, whereas in 1958 it was 315. This is called the Keeling Curve because it's very largely the work of, of one man, Charles David Keeling, who uh, died five years ago, but who invented the instrument to make these measurements and took the first data points himself. It's now carried on by an international uh, network of measuring stations. These data are rock solid. There isn't any doubt about them. People who think there's something wrong with these data are the kind of people who don't believe in anything uh, scientific. But everybody uh, who accepts the scientific way of looking at things will tell you that these data are trustworthy. Keeling, uh, whom I knew well, he spent his whole career at Scripps Institution of Oceanography in La Jolla, where I am, and so I knew him for about the last half of this curve up until his death. And he said he made the instrument about 10 times more accurate than he thought it needed to be just because he had figured out how to do that. And we've learned a lot about it. As you can see, there's an increase in carbon dioxide. And there's also annual wiggles. But also, you can tell, if you kind of mentally subtract out the annual wiggles, this isn't a straight line. There's parts where it rises more steeply, like towards the end. There's parts where it seems to level off. This, by the way, was the first Arab oil embargo when the combustion of oil and products went down because the source was restricted. And you can see lots of other things on here, and a great deal has been said about this. You can see La Niña's and El Niño's, for example. But what this really is, is a record of two things. The upward rise is entirely due to human effects, entirely. And that's not a speculation or a conjecture or alarmism. That's scientific, verifiable fact. And the reason we know that is that carbon dioxide that comes from burning coal and oil and natural gas has a different chemical isotopic signature from carbon dioxide from other sources, like, say, volcanoes. And so we can tell where a given molecule of carbon dioxide came from. And as more fossil fuel carbon dioxide is in the atmosphere, you can see, by the way, it was 315, it's 390. So in round numbers, one out of four molecules in, of CO2 in the atmosphere today is there because humans put it there. And CO2 from fossil fuels is, is, has the same greenhouse effect as CO2 from anywhere else, but it's distinguishable. And so you can back out the source of each of this, uh, these components of CO2. So this rise is entirely human caused. The annual wiggles are due to the photosynthesis and respiration. When plants, this is this station that Keeling picked was in uh, Mauna Loa. So it's a station partway up the side of a, of a volcanic mountain in Hawaii. And uh, <coughs> the, that's in the northern hemisphere. And so it follows the northern hemisphere seasons. It takes time for CO2 to mix around the world. But the average molecule of CO2, the one that came out of your tailpipe if you were driving over today, for example, is going to stay in the atmosphere for centuries. So this signal gets smoothed out, and in fact, the amount of CO2 anywhere in the world today for climate purposes is about the same, as long as you're away from uh, pollution sources or something like that. CO2 is high in this room, for example, because all of us are breathing it out. But if you're asking what the CO2 over Long Beach comes from, it's not the emissions of the good citizens of Long Beach. 
It's the emissions of all the people in their world and their parents and grandparents all mixed together because it stays there for a long time. Keeling had figured this out. There's some students here tonight from Santa Monica High School who are doing a project in partnership with the aquarium. So I want to say something to those students today. Keeling, when he started this, was a young man. He had just finished his PhD. He was in his 20s. And he was recruited to Scripps by one of the giants of earth science named Roger Ravel, who, by the way, was a founder of UC San Diego. And Ravel was a towering man, a magnetic personality, great charisma, used to being obeyed. And he said to Keeling, welcome to Scripps, and we're going to put your instrument on a ship, like good oceanographers do, and we're going to sail it around the world and measure CO2 everywhere. And then 10 years later, we'll repeat these measurements, and uh, we'll see whether it's changed. And Keeling, young man, looked at Ravel, powerful figure, his boss, and said, that's a really stupid idea. <laughs> because Keeling had been tinkering with this instrument for years, and he knew from having tried it out that the amount of CO2 was the same wherever you measured it, because it stayed in the atmosphere a long time, and that gives plenty of time for the winds to mix it around. So the amount of CO2 over Long Beach is the same as the amount of CO2 over Patagonia, roughly speaking. And Keeling said, what you need to do is put my instrument in one pristine location, say in the middle of the Pacific Ocean, where there's no source of CO2, and those measurements will be representative of the whole world. And they argued, and Keeling won, and Keeling was right. So students, it's OK to disagree with your teacher or your boss when you're sure you're right. <laughs> so what this uh, tells you is that mankind has changed the chemical composition of the atmosphere. CO2 is a rather pleasant gas. It's uh, colorless, odorless, non-toxic. It's the bubbles in champagne or beer or Coke. But it's a greenhouse gas. And although it's present in tiny quality, quantities, only a few hundred molecules per million molecules, it has an important climatic effect. And it, together with water vapor and a few other gases, also present in tiny quantities, keep the planet habitable. They're responsible for the natural greenhouse effect, the fact that the energy that we receive to the sun, which the, from the sun, which the Earth re-radiates to space, is partly trapped, like a blanket, roughly speaking, trapping heat. And the planet would have an average surface temperature below the freezing point of water were it not for this natural greenhouse effect. This is well understood. It's been well understood for a long time. A British physicist named Tyndall in the 1850s was testing CO2. He put it in the laboratory, and he shines infrared energy beams on it and measured the absorption. So we've known about the greenhouse effect. We know about it theoretically now, too, in great detail. It's as real as gravity, and we should be grateful for it. It keeps the planet habitable. The concern is not that we have a greenhouse effect. The concern is that humankind is inadvertently tinkering with it. We've added to the greenhouse effect and made it stronger and warmed the planet over the 150 plus years that we've been burning coal and oil and natural gas in large quantities to the degree that we are now having a significant climatic effect that promises to be a stronger climatic effect. So it's the unnatural or the human magnified greenhouse effect that is the concern. OK. We could uh, talk more about this slide. And given time, I might even come back to it. The next few figures I'm going to show you are from a book that was mentioned, The Copenhagen Diagnosis. It's a 50-page report. It's available free on the internet. I'm going to put some URLs up at the end so that those of you who want to dig more deeply into this uh, can get uh, this report and another one. All the figures I'm going to show you come from these two reports. They're written in plain English. And uh, they're free uh, for download by anybody. This Copenhagen diagnosis is not an IPCC report. I'm happy to talk about the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, but a group of us climate scientists decided in advance of the Copenhagen negotiations last winter that enough new science had happened that it deserved compiling and being written about to bring to the attention of the negotiators in Copenhagen. And uh, so we put out this report a year ago this month. Uh, to, and this figure and the next few are from that uh, report. There's 26 of us authors from eight different countries. We were self-selected and self-organized. So we get the credit for anything you like about that report or the blame for anything that you don't like. And what you're looking at here is the CO2 emissions. We know this very well from fossil fuel because uh, 
the world keeps track of the number of barrels of oil and uh, <coughs> tons of coal and so on that it burns. There's a very important secondary source, which is deforestation, not on this graph. And there are many tertiary sources. It turns out cement manufacture, for example, also uh, puts CO2 into the atmosphere. What you're looking at here, the gray area is kind of a confidence limit or an error, uh, is the amount of CO2 in billions of tons per year that's been emitted since 1990. We picked 1990 for several reasons, one of which is that it was the base year for the infamous Kyoto Protocol, which is a international treaty signed by many countries, not the United States, uh, that required the developed countries to reduce their emissions by about now, relative to 1990, by a few percent. So had all the nations of the world signed, it's a treaty that, by the way, is, is in effect now, even though the U.S. didn't solve it, didn't sign it, and enough countries that produced enough emissions did sign it, so it came into force. And some countries, but very few, have managed to meet their Kyoto targets. And if the whole world had done that, then the emissions rate would be a few percent below the base year of 1990 by the compliance period, which is roughly now. But instead, over this 20-year period from 1990 to today, you can see it's gone up by 41%, and you can see also that around 2003, the slope changes and the increase becomes much stronger. And that is largely due uh, to the rapid industrialization um, on the part of China, and to a lesser extent, other developing countries with large populations like India, Brazil. And <clears throat> so the emissions that have been put into the atmosphere in the past, as which, as I said, many of which are still present in the atmosphere, are largely due to the developed West, the United States, Europe, Japan, Australia, and so on. But China overtook the United States a couple of years ago. We can't be exactly sure when, because the data aren't that good, but within the last few years. So China today, although it has per capita emissions of CO2 or less, has so, so many more people in the United States that it is now the country with the largest component of emissions. And China and the U.S. together produce roughly half the global emissions, which tells you right away that speaking, looking ahead to the policy discussion, geopolitically it's going to be critical that China and the U.S. both reduce their emissions, since together they make up roughly half the global total. It's incidentally true that in the past, uh, years where the economy of the world uh, stood still or had recessions uh, would often resulted, because of less industrial activity, in a re temporary reduction of emissions. But the global recession of the past couple of years uh, has been partly outweighed by the growth in the large developing countries, so that the uh, rate of emissions didn't change much from 2009 to 2010, but didn't go down because that was compensated for, the recession's effect was compensated for by the very rapid um, growth of the use of fossil fuels in large developing countries. So for example, China today has a larger market for cars and trucks than the United States. And that's a recent development. So that tells you a good deal about what's uh, going to come ahead. So <clears throat> CO2 is increasing due to human activities. And to nobody's surprise, in the scientific community, temperature is increasing too. The dots here are the annual average of the global average surface temperature. That is, temperature measured um, in the lowest part of the atmosphere, a few feet above the ground at weather stations, supplemented by satellite data for ocean temperature. So it's a representative number uh, for the global average temperature. I'm happy to discuss in the Q&A period any questions about the veracity and reliability of this data. I'm happy to address issues such as, uh, is this contaminated by urban effects so that temperatures are being measured in hot cities to a greater effect? No, it's not. This is a representative number. It's agreed upon by the weather services of many countries. There is an urban effect, but it's in the 0.001 uh, level. And these are uh, basically trustworthy numbers for an, a variable, the global average surface, near surface air temperature that we've been measuring more or less reliably since the uh, mid-19th century. So we have something like 150 years of record, and it's higher now than it was in the past. The 
1990s were hotter than the 1980s. The first 10 years of the current century are hotter than the 1990s. But there are lots of ups and downs. So this is a, a, a blue trend line, smoothed uh, line over the, this period, last few decades. This is the range of natural variability, how much you can expect to see differences between cold years and warm years. For, because the world is full of other factors besides greenhouse gases, that affect annual temperatures. So for example, El Nino years produce larger atmospheric temperatures. Basically, heat comes from the ocean into the atmosphere. And La Nina years, the opposite effect, when the temperature pattern in the ocean is flipped to the mirror image, produce cool times. So this was 1998, uh, the largest El Nino on record in modern times. 2010, remember this is from a book that came out a year ago. So 2010 isn't here, and 2009 was temporary. 2010 is probably going to be the warmest um, year on record, from what we know in the first 10 months or so of it. But if somebody says, not any of you, of course, but one of your neighbors who's not as well informed, says, well, you know, there hasn't been any warming in the last 10 years, what that means is that they have uh, done what is politely called cherry picking. They have chosen as their starting point an anomalously warm year which was warm because it's an El Nino year. And then they've said, well, look, none of the years following that were as high as that, so global warming has stopped. Whereas the right way to do that is to, to take account of the fact that we have year-to-year -year variations for natural, well-understood reasons, and to do the smoothing here so that you're looking at a long-term uh, trend. The rate of rise is about a third of a degree Fahrenheit per decade, or two-tenths of a degree Celsius per decade, which is what the climate models uh, have predicted. And why the warming began uh, to, uh, to be stronger in the mid to late 1970s is an imperfectly understood uh, process. We think it had something to do uh, with the fact that air pollution, uh, which uh, can counteract the warming by reflecting away sunlight, uh, began to decrease then due to the Clean Air Act in the U.S. and comparable legislation in other countries. So that had been masking the warming that due to the greenhouse effect. But that's not clear, and there are, there are also other indications that a kind of natural climate shift may have occurred then. But since then, the warming has, uh, when it's treated in this smooth uh, fashion to smooth out the year-to-year -year variability, has uh, continued at very much the predicted um, term. That doesn't tell you that it's human caused. You see, I said CO2 went up and temperature went up. It doesn't prove that one caused the other. You know, maybe hemlines went up. Certainly the Dow Jones went up. I mean, there are lots of things that went up over this many decade period. We are confident that most of the warming is very likely, better than nine chances out of 10 in the IPCC's um, assessment, to have been due to human activities, and in particular to the strengthening of the greenhouse effect due to the added burden of CO2 in the atmosphere. There are other greenhouse gases too. CO2 is most important because it's larger in effect than the others and it lasts longer. And the reason that we're confident of human influence as the primary cause is that a great deal of very clever scientific detective work once has gone into that. This is not an allegation by uh, somebody with a particular political leaning. It's because the scientific community has carefully considered other factors that we know influence climate. So for example, the sun can vary in its brightness or output, but we can calculate how much that effect, because we've been measuring the solar variability very accurately from satellites since the late 70s, and it's 10 times smaller than the effect of the extra CO2. We know it's not the same kind of natural variability that causes ice ages to come and go, because we know what causes them. It's changes in the Earth's orbit around the sun that take tens of thousands to hundreds of thousands of years to happen. And they can't happen strongly enough or rapidly enough to cause this degree of warming on this short a time scale. In a few decades, the, the uh, climate has, has warmed rapidly. And there's a long string of that kind of work. We can measure how the warming varies with altitude, if the sun were causing it, we would expect to see warming at all levels. If it's greenhouse gases, we would expect to see cooling in the lower stratosphere, due both to ozone loss and to carbon dioxide radiating there. 
and that's what we do see. So we observe the fingerprint that our theories and models tell us is what we'd expect if it were greenhouse gases that were the, <coughs> the cause of the warming. And I'm happy again to talk in detail about that, but I want to tell you that this is just not an assertion, it's not somebody's um, political conviction, or it's not a conclusion that somebody has jumped to, it's the result of several decades of painstaking, careful scientific work on which the expert community is largely agreed. Here's another example of the effect of a warming world. In the Arctic, sea ice is now <coughs> melting much more rapidly than had been predicted. And what's shown in this very dramatic graph is a map of the Arctic. You can see Greenland here, for example. And you can see here, this was the average sea ice minimum. It, the sea ice reaches the minimum in late summer, around September. Uh, in a long period up to 2006, from the beginning of satellite data in, in the late 70s, whereas this was the minimum in 2007. There was a dramatic reduction. And we expect to see global warming amplified in the Arctic because of a number of physical processes that are unique to the Arctic. So, for example, in a warmer world, there's less snow and ice. That makes common sense. And when there's less snow and ice, the what was under the snow and ice is revealed, which is always darker. It's the darker surface of the ocean or the darker surface of land or trees. And so the result of taking the snow and ice away is to make the surface less reflective. And so in the warmer world, with the snow and ice gone, less sunlight is reflected away. And so instead of reflecting sunlight away, the darker surface absorbs sunlight. So the warming darkens the surface and enhances the warming. It's as though you had your house wired weird so that when the, uh, <coughs> when the uh, house got warm on a hot day, you turned on the furnace and made the warming worse instead of turning on the air conditioner. So it's amplified in the Arctic. And we expect, and the observations show, that the greatest warming is occurring in the Arctic. Same thing, by the way, doesn't happen at, near the South Pole in the Antarctic because you melt some ice, but there's a mile or more of ice under that. So you're not uh, darkening the, the net surface to the extent that's happening in the Arctic. So another way to look at this phenomena is this graph here. What you're seeing here is a function of time. Uh, 1900 on the left, the present on the right, is the uh, area of sea ice, the extent of sea ice, which can be observed from aircraft and so on. It's not the same as the volume because it doesn't take account of the thickness, but that's decreasing too. But this line here is the uh, a modeled extent, that is to say, what, the, what scientists have found by making computer simulations of the ice and predicted would happen with the warming that's observed. And the red line is the observations. So this, again, uh, starting around mid-century, the red line is the measurements of how, what the extent of sea ice was at the September minimum. And you can see it's been decreasing with time faster than the model. The blue area surrounding this black average is the extent. So the models that predicted the greatest loss of sea ice are here. The models that predicted the least extent of sea ice are there. And you can see there the observations are telling you that, that the models have underpredicted uh, the extent at which the ice is being lost. <clears throat> this is sea level. This is global sea level. How high is the ocean? This is an interesting kind of thing to think about. What determines how high the sea level is. When you go down to the beach, why isn't the water many feet lower than it is or many feet higher? And the answer is that it does go down and up by many feet as the climate changes. And we know this from geological evidence. It goes down in cold periods, like ice ages, and it goes up in warm periods, like the present. And the reason is several fold. For one thing, the ocean, like a lot of other things, takes up more volume when it's hot than when it's cold. So the same amount of water takes up more volume in an interglacial period, like the present, than in a glacial period. And also, in a glacial period, a lot of water is locked up as ice on land. That melts and eventually flows into the sea. So the amount of water increases in a warmer period as well. And in, that's not a small change. It's about 100 meters, about 300 feet globally. So ice ages, we can tell this from the geological evidence, we can see where the shoreline was at the, at the peaks of the last ice ages, and it was about 300 feet lower on global average than it is today. So we'd expect sea level to rise, 
This has many consequences, beach erosion, saltwater intrusion into estuaries, uh, damage of low-lying areas, and vulnerability to storms like hurricanes, and so on. And so sea level for a long time was measured by tide gauges, which are just a fancy name for floats uh, put on piers uh, near shorelines. But in recent years, there's been some wonderful technology, satellite altimetries. You can actually measure the distance between the satellite and the surface. And so you have a global uh, measurement of sea level. And you can see that where they're together, they are roughly the same. The blue satellite and the red tide gauge measurements uh, verify one another. But you can see it's going up. It's going up at a, at a rate that looks a little bit tiny. It's a few, uh, this is centimeters. There's two and a half centimeters to an inch, roughly. So this is about an inch, you know, and this is about two inches. And that, over a period of uh, several decades, doesn't seem important. But it's accelerating. And the best predictions today are that sea level, at the end of the current century, provided that we just keep on emitting fossil fuels at something like the present rate, um, will be maybe two feet, could be three feet, could be more uh, higher than at present. It's tricky, and it's something that is still scientifically being investigated. The IPCC report, which came out in 2007, there have only been four reports in the last 20 odd years, said it ought to go up by something like <clears throat> uh, up to a foot and a half or something like that, two feet at most. And they said, as a footnote, but that's because we don't understand some of the things that might cause it to increase further, like whether the ice sheets on Greenland and Antarctica, as well as uh, melting glaciers on land and thermal expansion are contributing. Now we know that uh, they are, that Greenland and Antarctica are losing mass. We've learned that in the last three years. And therefore, the current estimates of sea level rise are up to the one meter of three feet to, to two meters or six feet range by the end of this century. That's very serious that endangers uh, coastal property, it, it causes great loss of, of beaches. Uh, it's uh, the enormous number, fraction of the world's population lives near coasts. Many of the coasts are low-lying. So that's something with a big impact. We'll come to that a bit later. So sea level is rising at the high end of the IPCC projections. Temperature is rising coincident with the IPCC projections. And uh, Arctic sea ice is decreasing faster than IPCC projections. This is a figure that I'm going to linger on. It's uh, one that uh, is uh, in the Copenhagen Diagnosis. And it's a, a depiction of several possible futures. So what you're looking at today here is 2010, this dashed line, this year, out to mid-century. And this is the rate at which CO2 is being emitted in gigatons, billions of tons. And there are three uh, possible um, trajectories shown here as examples. And they are all trajectories chosen so that the total emissions gives you a two out of three chance of limiting global warming to two degrees Celsius relative to pre-industrial 19th century temperatures. Now, here's where the policy and the science intersect and where I'm going to be careful about which is which. There's nothing scientific about saying, I want to limit global warming to two degrees Celsius. That's a subjective decision. That's your or somebody's assessment of where things might get to be, quote, dangerous. The US and every other country on the planet is a signatory to a treaty called the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change. The first President Bush signed at the Earth Summit in Rio for the US. The Senate ratified it. But it's an aspirational treaty. It doesn't force you to do anything. It just says, we'd like to work to avoid, quote, dangerous anthropogenic interference with the climate system. That means dangerous human-caused messing around with the climate system. But it doesn't say what dangerous is. And there hasn't been, until very recently, anything like formal agreement as to what level is dangerous. It's a little bit like your cholesterol, you know? Is there a magic number below which your doctor assures you you can't have a heart attack and above which he says you're definitely going to have one? No, of course not. It's a risk factor. And there are many analogies between climate science and medical science, including prevention being better than cure. And so if the nations of the world were to agree on a limit, science could tell them what it takes to get there. And again, it's a little bit like cholesterol. If you agree on where you're going to get it to be, then the whole arrangement of nutritional science and modern medicine tells you 
about what you should eat and how much you should exercise and maybe what kind of statins you should take to keep your cholesterol to that level. So two degrees Celsius above pre-industrial temperatures, which is roughly three and a half degrees Fahrenheit, is the internationally agreed <coughs> aspirational goal. The European Union has formally adopted it. Other countries like the US have said they agree. And once you say that you want to keep the climate no more than two degrees Celsius warmer than it was in the 19th century, then science can tell you something about how much CO2 and other greenhouse gases you can have. And as I said, it's the cumulative amount that matters because it stays in the atmosphere for so long. And what this says is that if we emitted CO2 at the present rate, not accelerated it anymore like in the first graph, we'd only have 20 more years before we'd have to stop emitting altogether in order to have uh, this likelihood of limiting the warming to that. But in more realistically, if we peaked our emissions next year and started to decline, we could decline relatively gradually. You should see 300 fraction percent so that by mid-century we were still emitting some CO2, whereas if we wait till the middle of the current decade, we have to uh, decrease them more rapidly. You see it's essentially the area under these curves that's the same. And if we wait till the end of the decade, the red line, then we have to uh, decrease them very rapidly. So by 2040, we've essentially weaned the world from fossil fuels. We're not burning coal or oil or natural gas, or We've developed some technology that we don't have available on a large scale today for either sucking CO2 out of the atmosphere or capturing it and storing it away uh, before it gets into the atmosphere from, say, chimneys of power plants. I call this the ski slope diagram, and I call this the bunny slope, and this the intermediary slope, and this is the double black diamond expert slope. But what it says is that there's an urgency to this. As I said, emitting at the current rates, which means uh, you just go, go out here for 20 more years means you then have to uh, stop cold turkey, which is impossible. In fact, economically, it may be impossible to have this uh, expert slope that decreases around 9% per year. Economists will tell you that might not be doable. But it's an urgency here that doesn't have to do with adopting this target. That's a subjective decision, a risk tolerance issue, a priorities and issue that governments have agreed to. But once you've agreed to that, then science says this is no longer a subject you can dither about and discuss and procrastinate and argue about. That you've got to actually peak your emissions of carbon dioxide and start to decrease them within the current decade. This is not like steel tariffs where if you can't negotiate them this year, maybe you can get it done next year or next decade or sometime in the future. Here, Mother Nature gives you a window and it has to happen within that window or the chances of its happening are very slim. And these are major changes. This means a major change in the world's energy system, which is now 80% plus fossil fuels. So it means decrease in absolute amount of energy and or heavier reliability, reliance on nuclear or renewables, uh, energy conservation, energy efficiency maxed out. There's no silver bullet. There may be a silver buckshot. There are lots of things that contribute. This may be barely technologically doable, so far, my judgment is there hasn't been much sign uh, that there's political will. Neither China nor the US, for example, which together emit half the CO2, have shown any willingness to sign on to, to this. It's unpopular in the present Congress, more so than in the previous Congress. And uh, it may not be happening. But the science tells you that these emissions have to happen, have to stop growing and start decreasing rapidly in a few years. OK. The next few figures I'm going to show you, and then I'll stop and take questions, are from a report out this year from the National Academy of Sciences, a very distinguished panel of scientists uh, reviewed uh, extensively, uh, called uh, Climate Stabilization Targets. And what this group of scientists did in this very readable report, and again, I'll tell you how you get your own free copy, uh, was looked at the impacts on various aspects of life, various parts of the climate that affect how people live, of warming of a particular degree. So this is one degree of warming. We're, by the way, today at about 0.7 or 0.8 tenths of a degree Celsius, or roughly speaking, a degree and a half Fahrenheit um, above pre-industrial temperatures. So we're about here. This is the two degree target. This is three degrees. And what you're looking at here are the yield from certain important uh, crops, 
uh, maize and soybeans in the U.S., uh, rice in Asia, wheat in India, and maize in Africa. And you can see that at one degree, there might even be an increase in yield. The, the areas uh, shaded around here are, again, an estimate of the uncertainty uh, in these figures. But beyond that, there comes a rather significant, this is in percent, this is minus 20, minus 40, minus 60, minus 80 percent. Um, so there are, at two, three, four degrees, there are in uh, many of these crops sharp decreases in the yield because uh, at higher temperatures you're not uh, getting benefits. There are other things that happen. There's greater vulnerability uh, to pests of various kinds, for example, or crop diseases. So, and by the way, this report is also a very sneaky attempt to foist the metri metric system on the American public, which has shown no enthusiasm for this. So here's your Fahrenheit to Celsius conversion here. You know, five degrees Celsius is nine degrees Fahrenheit. And uh, so it's not quite double, but uh, that's what it is. So if you want to convert this, so they, they wrote this report knowing that the American public, say the older American public, school kids are comfortable with metric units, and scientists work in them. But the American public doesn't know that uh, one degree uh, Celsius is, uh, uh, <coughs> is nine-fifths of that in Fahrenheit. So that's why the two-degree target here is 3.6 degrees Fahrenheit. So you've got to get fluent at converting. The report also said that in a warmer world, there's a greater chance of extremes on the warm side. So the dark area here is uh, the chance of having very hot summers. Now you can see the fine print here. It's a, a, a summer uh, as hot or hotter than the hottest people today have experienced. So essentially, this is the, it's a 5% level thing. So the things that are 1 in 20 chance today become in almost all the world rather commonplace uh, in a warmer world. So you have a greater chance of extreme events, of extreme temperatures. You're basically shifting the whole distribution of, say, summer mean temperatures over to the warm side, so you're greatly increasing the chance of, of uh, warmer summers. And we already see today that many more heat wave, high temperature records are being broken, two to three times as many as low temperature records. And then they assessed a number of uh, aspects. You see, fire depends on, on climate, you know, hot, uh, dry climate as everybody who lives in the American West knows, is a greater fire danger. And so they said for each degree Celsius of warming, for a range of one or two or three or four degrees, we can expect a big increase, two to four hundred percent increase per degree in the area burned in the Western United States. And that has to do with reduction in, in water supply. For example, in a warmer world, there's less river flow. The Sierra snowpack is more rain pack. It's uh, lost early in the water year. It's not available in the summer to keep the fuel uh, moist. And so uh, in a warmer world, there's greater fire danger. And it scales roughly linearly with the warming. So there's twice as much danger at 2 degrees warming than 1, and four times as much at 4 degrees. And for each degree, there's this very substantial increase in area burn. So this is a conclusion of a lot of applied research, that is, research that, that ex examines the dependence of uh, fire danger on uh, climate. For rainfall, depends on where you are. One of the things that happens in a warmer world, and it's already happening now for complex reasons, is that the migratory storms that move from west to east in middle latitudes move further north in the northern hemisphere, further south in the southern hemisphere. That is, they move away from the tropical regions and subtropics more toward the poles. So you get more rain in Alaska and less rain in Southern California. And that's what this says. For each degree, you get a few percent less rain in the southwestern U.S., where we are, but more rainfall or snowfall in Alaska. And it's also a, a change in the distribution of rainfall. In a warmer world, more rain falls in extreme events, in heavy downpours rather than slow drizzles. And that's, again, already happening. We see that happening in the U.S. and elsewhere in the world. So these are products of climate forecasts made with computer models, but also verified by observations. And here, you're making it quantitative. And you're saying, essentially, again, it scales roughly linearly. So two degrees warming gives you twice as much of these effects, because this is per degree Celsius. Okay. For rivers, 
rivers are drying up, Lake Mead level is, is uh, falling, there's less rain to uh, feed the rivers and so on. For each degree Celsius of warming, there's 5 to 10 percent uh, less stream flow in some rivers. There's a lot of variability here, so the report details which ones, but it includes important uh, rivers in the American South and, and Southwest. And as you may know, uh, there's river flow decreasing already. The problem in Southern California of uh, climate change is several factors. Sea level rise is certainly one of them. I've mentioned uh, saline intrusion into estuaries and loss of beaches and coastal erosion. But also, because there's less uh, snowpack and uh, then there's less uh, stream flow, and we're seeing that again uh, already. Food, that's tough, an effect that, that that's a, a, an impact that combines many of these effects. And it has again to do with the reduced uh, uh, yield of these, um, these major crops. And again, for each degree in this quasi-linear range of one, two, three, four degrees. By the way, business as usual for the end of this century, the median prediction of the models is, is uh, uh, something like uh, four, four and a half degrees, uh, five, five and a half degrees, in the range of eight or 10 degrees Fahrenheit. And for each Celsius degree, you get a reduction of five to 15 percent uh, in yield. And finally, sea ice, for each degree Celsius, there's a reduction of this much in the annual average sea ice extent, and this is the uh, seasonal minimum, 25 percent per degree in September. So Arctic sea ice is decreasing and is forecast to decrease uh, further. I hesitated to put this graph on here. It's not good, or this, this table is not good pedagogy. But I wanted to make a point here, which is that climate change goes on for a long time, because parts of the climate system have a lot of inertia, and the ice and the oceans are paramount in those effects. And so this is the number that we see on the Keeling graph. Remember, it's 390 now. And it says that for 350, the best estimate of the warming that we'll see promptly, that so-called transient warming, is half a degree Celsius, which is the midpoint of a range between 4 and 7 tenths. But in the long term, the warming continues. That is, the warming is delayed. It's buffered. The ocean and so on acts like a flywheel. And in round numbers, you see, if you wait long enough, twice the warming that you see in the near term. So the strategy of waiting to observe severe impacts before you decide to act about them uh, has the drawback that it commits you to a future with twice as much warming as you've already seen. So if you see this in the near term, you're going to see this in the longer term. So in many ways, as I've said, humanity has willy-nilly, inadvertently, unintentionally taken control of the climate system. And because we're dealing with what we can do with CO2 in the relatively near term, a few years at most, a few decades, we are having a profound effect, whether we wanted to or not, on the climate that our children and their children will experience. So this is a critical time. This is an urgency that hasn't to do with politics or ideology or whether you're a liberal or a conservative. There's no liberal or conservative thermometers or differential equations. This says that the climate system itself tells you that this is a particularly important and critical time. There's a narrow window in which, if humanity wants to, it can influence the climate for a long time to come. OK, I'm going to uh, uh, zoom through some of these since it's uh, already closing in on the final time. They amplify the message. What you're looking here is, first of all, the bars here indicate the uncertainty. Real scientists are very upfront about how well they know a number. So you know whether it's the acceleration of gravity or some other number, a scientific measurement also tells you the degree to which you have confidence in that number and how high it could be. If you say it's here, it could be here or here. So what you're looking at here is how the cumulative uh, carbon emissions uh, relate to temperature change. And there's a, there's a substantial um, margin of uncertainty here. So for example, we think that if you were to do the thought experiment of instantaneously doubling carbon dioxide and then waiting for the climate to come equilib to, into equilibrium with that, it would warm somewhere around three degrees with a probable range of two to four and a half degrees. And that's because there's physical processes that we don't fully understand. How will the clouds react, for example, is a big one. And so we are upfront about that. And that's why I've expressed the previous results probabilistically. And I said that the ski slope diagram was such as to give you a, 
two out of three chance of meeting the, the two degrees Celsius. That takes into the account this uncertainty. So this is saying that a lot depends on how much carbon is emitted um, in the future. This is, as you can see, fossil fuel, land use, and so on. So we don't know what the emissions path will be. That's the biggest uncertainty in estimating how things will look in, say, 2050 or 2100. But we also don't know with perfect certainty the degree to which the warming uh, depends on the total amount of carbon. And this is the National Academy's stabilizing uh, <coughs> climate stabilization targets version of my ski slope diagram. So what you're looking at here is in four uh, pictures, the three colors are three possible futures. This is the annual emissions uh, of carbon. So they all say we're going to peak our use of, uh, of uh, carbon dioxide producing fossil fuels in the near term and then decrease it. And uh, here's three possible scenarios. And this says this is the cumulative emissions. This is the rate at which you're putting it into the atmosphere. This is the cumulative emissions, what you put in this year plus last year plus the year before that. So as the emissions go down to zero, this curve flattens out, as you see here. And this, therefore, is the concentration, because the CO2, once you put it there, tends to stay in the atmosphere a long time, centuries on average. Uh, then this closely tracks that. And this is temperature, which closely tracks the amount. So you've got to separate this out. Emissions is the rate at which we're dumping this stuff in the atmosphere. We're using the atmosphere as a free dump for the waste product of burning fossil fuels. Therefore, this is the net effect integrated over time. This is the resulting amount of carbon dioxide that's in the atmosphere, because we put it in at these rates. And this is how temperature behaves, which tracks this number here, which tracks this number here. I thought I would introduce a, one slide of history. So I picked a paper that I'm fond of. It was published more than 30 years ago by two very perceptive Swiss scientists who said, and I'll translate this, for a prescribed maximum increase of 50% in the concentration of carbon dioxide, the total amount above the pre-industrial 19th century value, of, which is around 280 in the Keeling units, then the production, meaning the rate at which we're emitting carbon dioxide, could grow by about 50% from now until the beginning of the 21st century, which we're now 10 years into, but should then decrease rapidly. That's a one-sentence, sort of Swissified uh, description of my ski slope diagram. And they knew it in 1978. So the world has dithered and procrastinated and doubted and sown confusion for over three decades, but we've known scientifically we know it better now, sharper numbers, more data, better models. But we knew in principle, more than 30 years ago, that this is the time when emissions reductions would be required to happen at the latest. Had we put them into effect 30 years ago, we would have had a much easier uh, time of it. But there's a limit. You know, Mother Nature doesn't let you procrastinate forever. OK, here's the ski slope diagram again. So if this, is, this picture is my take home message. This is my next to the last slide. And uh, I want to say it once more and as, as straightforwardly as I can. The governments of the world have agreed on 2 degrees Celsius warming, of which we've already had about 0.7 or 0.8, more than a third, of warming relative to the 19th century, say 1860, before the world started using coal oil and natural gas in large amounts. If you accept this non-scientific value judgment as the amount of warming that's tolerable, that distinguishes between warming you can live with and warming which is dangerous in the sense of the UN Framework Convention, then <laughs> with uncertainties that I've discussed in, in models in feedbacks and so on, you'll have a two out of three chance of making that target if you either let global fossil fuel emissions peak in the very near term and then decline somewhat gradually or wait a few years to peak or wait up till 10 years to peak. But if you wait, you have to decrease them more rapidly because it's the total amount of carbon dioxide you've put into the atmosphere that matters. And if you wait past this, if you wait current emissions for 20 more years, I didn't draw it on here, so that's a curve that goes a straight line here, then by about 2030, it has to drop abruptly to zero. So that's the choice. If you can't do that, then you're going to have greater warming. And then you're going to have the effects that I've outlined from the Academy report. 
that is to say, effects on everything from fire danger to, uh, to crop yields to river flow. The last thing I want to do is say a few words about what these URLs are. Um, this is my site. So I'm going to leave this up during the question period. So if you want to copy any of them down, you can. Or you Google me, you'll also get to this. This also has my email address. Students, if you say you're from Santa Monica High School, I'll, I'll, I'll answer your question. Um, this is the Copenhagen Diagnosis Report. It's also going to be published commercially next year, but it's available free. and we'll, we'll, It's a 50-page uh, free download in plain English. Um, this is the report we wrote last year, 26 climate scientists from eight countries. The first half of the figures I showed roughly tonight uh, came from this document. The ski slope diagram is in this document. Uh, this clunky looking URL is uh, National Academy Press. Uh, this is the, uh, the National Academy study on climate stabilization targets from which the last half roughly of the figures uh, that I showed tonight came. The IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, has all its reports, all its recent reports, available on free download. Um, this is uh, the French word, French abbreviation for Switzerland. It's headquartered in Geneva. Um, I'm happy to talk in the question period about the IPCC and how it works. These are the definitive uh, scientific assessments. Um, there was some confusion about a few uh, rather trivial errors in the IPCC report. It isn't perfect. But in a 3,000-page report, there were a handful of errors that didn't affect the main conclusions. And this is the gold standard. We use this as a textbook for graduate students. If your neighbor is fond of saying things like, the temperature record is contaminated by uh, bad instruments and urban uh, heat effects, or it's the sun that's responsible for, uh, for this, or uh, the CO2 going up is not man-made, it's put in by volcanoes, or any of the uh, often repeated but thoroughly discredited arguments that essentially give you a reason to distrust all of climate science. There are many good sites, but this is a particularly clever one to use because you can take it and then you can click on whichever level of explanation you want. You know, one uh, designed basically um, for uh, very young students um, on up through an intermediate explanation onto a full scientific explanation with equations, references to the technical literature, graphs, and so on. This is a blog uh, run by a bunch of good climate scientists. It's up to date. I read it every day. And uh, it treats interesting issues. It's rather technical. And I would say, like many blogs on the internet, you know, there's no quality control. But if you trust the main postings by the scientists who run this site and treat the bloggers by uh, people who send in comments uh, skeptically or with some degree of, uh, of, uh, <coughs> of a grain of salt, you might say, then it's, it's a lot of fun reading. So I'm going to leave these up during the question period. And uh, I want to repeat that within reason, I will, uh, my email and other contact information is there. I'm happy to hear from any of you. You have been very patient, and I'm finishing on time. Thank you very much. What about policy? Ah, what about policy? I think my mic is still on, so you, don't, you can keep that mic out there. Well, I think um, if you ask me, and I'll repeat the warning, uh, if I give you a policy recommendation, I think um, it's not pure science. It's informed by science, but also by my worldview, you might say, my priorities and values. And when people ask me what um, can be done, I say, well, for an individual, there's many things you can do, some of which are personal actions. It does help uh, to economize, to drive a smaller car, shorter distances, take mass transport, telecommute, bike to work, don't have too many children. But um, those are uh, both good because multiplied by 7 billion people, uh, they make an effect. But they're also consciousness raising, you know, in the same way that a, a yarmulke or a rosary doesn't make you a good person, but it reminds you of the value of being a good person. So I recommend people do those things. and I don't belittle them at all. You know, recycle, do all the, the things that, uh, that you know about. But also be uh, politically aware. One reason why we don't have um, strong climate legislation, my personal view, in the United States on the federal level yet, is that people haven't told their politicians that it's a high priority for them. It doesn't rank up in anybody's list with national security and economic prosperity and so on. It's number 17. And so you, the politicians don't feel pressure to do this. If you tell the person who wants your vote that this is important to you, if enough people do that, 
That's what motivates politicians to, to act. I'm actually encouraged by many of the things that happen on uh, the corporate, individual, state, and local level. I'm a fan of AB 32, the, the uh, California uh, <coughs> bill that's passed by the legislature and signed by Schwarzenegger. But I think that's a model for what the feds could do. We'll see what happens. We'll see how much teeth it has and how, whether it gets weakened as time goes, goes on. But there hasn't yet been comparable uh, action on the federal level. And there are many other countries that um, could also uh, do more. In terms of uh, modifications to the system, I think there's a lot of low-hanging fruit. I think the, uh, the gains to be made from energy efficiency and energy conservation are enormous and often have negative costs and are often things you'd want to do anyway because they have many other benefits, like reducing dependence on foreign oil. You know, we import two-thirds of the oil we use in this country, and it hurts the balance of payments, and we subsidize the rest in many ways by, by ignoring externalities, as the economists call them. I think that in the near term, the thoughtful analyses of this say that there won't be a magic bullet. So for example, you will have to press reliance on renewables. You will have to have greater use of nuclear in the near term as a kind of bridging technology uh, towards the, uh, <coughs> the good technologies that we can hope for in future. I think a lot of research on these doing. I think technically much can be done. My view is that there's a lack of political will. I favor a carbon tax, a revenue-neutral carbon tax that's refunded to households uh, uh, rather than cap-and-trade. I think it has uh, many values. But remember, this is a poor meteorologist making economic prescriptions for the planet. So once again, when I talk about science, I'm trying to summarize good science as best I understand it for you. When I'm talking about policy, a lot of my personal views, and I greatly respect those who, who hold other ones. Um, in your talk, you didn't mention two important uh, potential sources of carbon and sequestering places for carbon, the, the world oceans and topsoil. How would that affect your information? Well, the world oceans, uh, one could say a lot about, and I work at an oceanographic institution, and uh, most of the CO2 that you put in the atmosphere eventually ends up in the ocean, and global warming's evil twin is ocean acidification. The oceans are already acidifying. And... Uh, it's incidentally a secondary, an effect that cannot be stopped by the usual geoengineering proposals. I'm skeptical of geoengineering in general. That is the attempt to intentionally modify the climate in such a way as to uh, counteract the warming caused by the strengthening of the greenhouse effect. So, for example, it's proposed to float various kinds of reflective devices, sulfate aerosols, their chemical precursors, uh, small balloons, and so on in the atmosphere to reduce the amount of sunlight absorbed in the hope that that would compensate for the warming. I'm in favor of research about that, uh, but uh, again, it's a policy judgment. I don't, I don't favor deployment. I think the risk of side effects is too great. And one thing that none of those schemes help with is the acidification of the ocean. And that's something we know less about than we would like to and are going to in a few years. But there are plenty of grounds for thinking that uh, ocean acidification, for example, uh, inhibits the formation of calcium carbonate shells by uh, many marine creatures, including many of those near the base of the food chain. And we don't know a great deal about what happens in an acidified ocean. But uh, there's a lot of research underway, and there's no reason to think the effects are going to be going to be small. Um, topsoil is a whole other issue. There are a lot of uh, potential feedbacks that can occur in a warming world. And uh, I'm going to stray off topsoil for a second because I, I want to mention some of them, which is that in a warmer world, you increase the risk that other sources of CO2 and other greenhouse gases, methane, for example, will be triggered. For example, they're trapped in clathrates in the Arctic. And uh, these are tipping points. We don't know exactly when they're going to happen. All we know is that the risk of them happening goes up. And those happen both in the biogeochemical side of the picture and in the physical side of the picture. For example, ice sheets on Greenland, for example, could destabilize in a warmer world, which would greatly raise sea level rapidly. You know, the ice sheet doesn't melt drop by drop, but it slides off into the sea, so to speak, in big chunks. And we know geologically from the evidence that's happened in the paleo world when this level of warming that we're talking about has been sustained. But is it going to happen in five or 50 years instead of 500 or 5,000 years, we don't know. It's a tipping point. It's a kind of uh, trigger that, that can come. So 
it's all of those, those kinds of risks, I think, that come into play when you set a tolerable limit uh, as being a number like two degrees Celsius. That's an incomplete answer to your question, but oh, that's a good question. Am I part of the response team uh, toward attacks or accusations of climate scientists? I'm active in that, in that I'm a source for journalists and so on. There are several uh, individuals and organizations who have announced that they would like to do a more organized kind of war room rapid response team so that when somebody makes a blanket accusation of, of climate scientists, such as uh, occurred uh, when the, a year ago when the emails from the server in England were hacked, said climate scientists have uh, committed fraud, have uh, distorted their data, have uh, not complied with good scientific practice. There's a feeling of many people in the community that we ought to speak up right away about that and uh, you know, give a very active defense uh, in the case where the accusations are false. And uh, I'm uh, not formally affiliated with the rapid response teams that have been announced by the American Geophysical Union and uh, by uh, a physicist named John Abraham, but I'm in touch with them and I speak to reporters all the time. And I, think, I think that uh, speaking to journalists and politicians is a good thing. After all, our research is paid for by tax money. And when the results are important, when people need to know about them, when they can have a policy effect, I think we scientists have an obligation to communicate them intelligibly and usefully if, if we possibly can. So I'm in favor of that. I don't particularly enjoy the um, mudslinging and the counter mudslinging and so on. I get hate email and death threats, I, and I'd rather not. Um, and, uh, but I'm, I think that communicating sound climate science clearly is good for everybody. You know, you can differ on policy, you can, you can hold differing opinions, but you can't differ on facts. You know, you're entitled to your own opinion, but you're not entitled to make up your own facts.